So what you're going to see at some point, let's see here, um, the factory of the future, I'm taking this very quickly because I'm trying to cover a lot. And as I said, I don't really want it to finish around midnight. So <laughs> um, here is the factory of the future. Uh, I had one of the uh, artists at graphic artists at work uh, draw this thing up, and it looks pretty good. Um, you can imagine different materials coming in and being deposited, and layer by layer, you're building this jet aircraft from the ground up with different materials, like the rubber and the, uh, uh, on the tires, and then all the, the everything's in fully assembled condition. And all the electronics are being uh, also layer by layer being made, the jet engine, everything. So that by the time you're done, all you do is add jet fuel and you can take off. It, it's, it's fully ready to go. There's no assembly line, no tooling. Um, and now this is not an aircraft factory because the exciting thing about this is that the next file that's being downloaded could be for a video camera, it could be for a Ferrari, um, whatever you want. So isn't that exciting? Yes. You know? and, and now we're maybe 20, 30 years from doing something like that. You know, there are a lot of things we can do already, and we're moving in that direction. <clears throat> so um, this is something that's uh, coming in, you know, in the future. It's already in many ways in place. But the reason I'm here is to tell you that all this is going to shrink down to the nano level and going to, you know, this is going to be superseded by nanotechnology. And uh, that's going to go really crazy. So we'll, we'll go on with that. <clears throat> uh, now, um, at work, a lot of people tell me, um, you know, you've got to, do this really fast, we're in a hurry. They're always in a hurry for everything. And that, it's called rapid manufacturing. So of course they expect it you know, to be that way. But I remind them, it's not instant prototyping or instant manufacturing. It's rapid, manufa um, rapid manufacturing. But uh, there is an example of instant manufacturing, and that's photography. Uh, I remember as a kid uh, in Germany, in Berlin, where I grew up, you know, I had my little Kodak camera, I'd take a picture, and then you take it to the uh, Kodak uh, shop, and then a week later you get your pictures. And now, you know, on the cell phone, you take a picture, even video, and you can transmit it instantly to anywhere in the world. That's instant manufacturing. And we're so um, numb now to all this new technology, we don't. Uh, you know, in a sense, we just accept it because what else are you going to do? You're going to use it, but um, aren't you just like sometimes you have to step back and think? You know, what was it like uh, if you showed this to uh, someone a hundred years ago, or even fifty years ago? You know, it, it, it's like Arthur C. Clarke saying that uh, you know, if the advanced technology is advanced enough, it'll seem like magic. And so, for people a hundred years ago, this would be sheer magic, but we live with it every day. So um, now, with nano, uh, first uh, quick intro, um, nanotechnology really deals with systems that are between 1 to 100 nanometers in size in one of the three axes, or one of the three directions, or in all of them. Um, so a nanometer is a billionth of a meter, and you could take 10 hydrogen atoms, put them end to end, you get one nanometer, which is like 10 angstroms. Physicists use the term angstrom. Uh, but uh, then, you know, 1,000 nanometers is a micron, and 1,000 microns is a millimeter, 1,000 millimeters is a meter. So, you know, simple with the uh, metric system, very straightforward. And the DNA molecule is actually very narrow. It's, it's Actually, fairly long DNA molecule, but um, it's only two and a half nanometers wide. To get a little more of a sense of it, you know, the smallest ant is actually, if you look at it in terms of nanometers, like two million nanometers in length. You know, so uh, ant is unbelievably huge to someone from the nano world. You know, 
But if you uh, start moving down in size, um, when you get down to one micron, that uh, one, you know, micro, you see that little micrometer there? Uh, when you get down to that point, that's where optical microscopes fail. And we've, there have been some new developments that actually give them capability further down, but a normal optical microscope can't see below, I know, like uh, uh, E. coli bacterium is about the limit of what they can see. Then you go to the electron microscopes. And because uh, the frequency of light, you know how light has different frequency, the different colors? Those frequencies are so large in comparison to, I mean, they're in that micron range, so you can't really uh, get any clear view of anything below that. So now we come, start coming down to those, like the uh, smallest bacterium, like getting down um, pretty small, that's really like 200 nanometers. But influenza virus is kind of at the top of the scale of, of the nano uh, um, scale. You know, we show you the mesoscale from, goes up to 1,000 nanometers. But the 1 to 100 is really the, uh, the place where all this exciting stuff happens. And the reason that we have to develop a whole new technology at this point is because this is where you get the overlap of quantum mechanics from the atomic uh, world, and then and you get the overlap of uh, regular classical physics, which is uh, you know from the larger size. And when those two overlap, you, you have a problem. You know you have to think things through differently because you can't uh, like if you have a bunch of uh, like fluid dynamics, you know, if you have like something fluid going through a pipe, um, you have a whole, um, that's all described by fluid dynamics. But if you get down to like a carbon nanotube and you have some atoms coming through there, more like boulders going through a trash can. It's not fluid dynamics anymore. So you have to have a whole another way to describe these things. And uh, how do we manipulate the things at the nano level? Um, one of the ways is the top-down technique uh, you see there, and that is we use microscopes. As I just mentioned, you know, the electron microscopes that can go down. So we have a large tool that manipulates a nano size uh, particle. And the older um, electron microscopes were passive. The exciting thing that's made really made nanotechnology possible nowadays is that we have, instead of passive microscopes, we have active microscopes that actually place, uh, can place like DNA strands in different places. They can actually place individual atoms in their respective places. And uh, so I'll get a little more into that. And uh, now from the bottom up, um, that's the other technique. It's really like some people say, what's a nine letter word for nanotechnology? Chemistry. But chemistry really uh, doesn't manipulate individual atoms with precision. It just has like a huge reaction taking place that gives you what you want, but you don't have that um, digital individual uh, capability. So ideally then, once uh, we get further along, we start to do bottom to bottom, which is when we have nano tools that manipulate uh, atoms individually. So you have thousands of these tools that manipulate uh, the uh, molecules. And that's really when things will uh, completely change our world. Here's another example. And that's, you see the letter F up there, made out of 1,660 aluminum atoms. And uh, you see it kind of changing there to a number four that doesn't look very good anymore. What's happening there is uh, when you design in CAD, computer-aided design, you design one of these uh, like molecular machines at the nano level. First, it looks real nice like that letter F, but w that's at zero Kelvin, absolute zero, and um, that's minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. That's as cold as it gets you know, in nature. And at that point, the atoms are very quiet. 
And, and so you think, well, you know, also, you know, it's just not smooth. You can't get it smooth because those are individual atoms. So smoothness is impossible. Uh, but now you bring it up to room temperature, like uh, the fourth example, that's a Brownian motion starts jiggling all the atoms. You know, heat, this is normal heat, like this is 300 Kelvin is room temperature. And, at, you know, so it doesn't look so good there. So that's one of the things you have to deal with if you're going to build things at the nano level. And here is this, uh, my colleague at uh, uh, NanoRex. Uh, he founded the company some years back, a uh, really neat guy. Um, and he created NanoEngineer One. Uh, it's the first uh, CAD system for nano design. And here we get an example of what this would look like. He, uh, he's designed quite a few of these. but. It'll be some time before we can actually make them at the nanoscale. Uh, but uh, it's, it's very complex because at that level, one of the problems is uh, the static uh, electricity taking place. So a lot of these atoms, they stick together, and you can't get them to do anything. So by, like the yellow atoms are sulfur atoms, and they repel each other so they're able to not stick, and that way you could get something like this type of machine. You notice how it's jiggling because it's this, the simulation is at room temperature. <clears throat> and here's the actual um, CAD system where you design. And you can see over on the left the, the periodic table, the different, different um, elements that you can choose. And then they automatically have all the hooks for the valences of the different molecules of different atoms and how they fit together. And then you bring them up to room temperature to simulate and that sort of thing. So it's an amazing system. He's developed it quite a bit further now. Uh, but, and I've mentioned this before, the uh, problem of tolerance is uh, a major thing in manufacturing. But at nanomanufacturing, you don't have that problem anymore because every atom of uh, whatever type it is, like a sulfur atom, is always exactly identical. And, uh, and then if you have like this machine that I showed you, um, uh, well, the atoms don't wear out. They're there for millions, billions of years. And uh, the uh, atomic bonds will never fatigue. There is no such thing. And you can't scratch them. Because uh, scratch is only when things, molecules separate. But when you're at this atomic level, what are you going to scratch? You know? So um, at this point, the only thing that can disrupt that machine is when you bring in a large amount of energy. And the electrons jump to the outer shells. <clears throat> then you have a little bit of a problem. And you could uh, disrupt that machine. But if you just leave it as it is, it'll run like that for millions of years, billions of years. So that, that's a whole different way of thinking in terms of making things. Um, there we go. Uh, now, um, example of this process is uh, dip pen nanolithography from a company called Nano Inc. Uh, what they've done is uh, they use an atomic force microscope. And so the scanning tunneling microscopes, or STMs, and atomic force microscopes, or AFM for short, those are the type of, uh, uh, type of microscopy that we do at the nano level. And as I said, you know, they, it's not passive. It's active. And so you have a tip. The tip of that um, atomic force microscope is actually 15 nanometers in width at the very tip. So that's the world's smallest pen, you know, unbelievably thin. You, know. you could probably take uh, 10, um, uh, 10,000 of those uh, end to end, and it would uh, form the width of a human hair, maybe. You know. It's just it's unbelievable. You know. So that's the world's smallest pen. Now, what's interesting is. You know, they've got like 55,000 of these pens you know, placing things uh, layer by layer. Again, you are, this is additive layer manufacturing. 